well, I'm back. Now, depending on where you stand in the traditionalist movement, that will be either good news or bad news. But in any case, we say to the Contists have maintained for decades that the post-Vatican II popes cannot be true popes because of public heresy. Part of the proof is that the Vatican II popes have promulgated universal disciplinary laws that are evil, that harm faith or morals. Examples, the new mass, the new code of canon law. The recognize and resist or R and R wing of the traditionalist movement tries to defeat these arguments by accusing various pre-Vatican II popes of heresy or by maintaining that the church can give evil in her universal disciplinary laws. Thus, they recycle charges of doctrinal error or heresy against Popes Nicholas I, Vigilius, Honorius, Liberius, John XXII, or Alexander VI. Protestants and others who rejected papal infallibility made the same accusations, of course, and all the charges have been repeatedly refuted by Catholic dogmatic theologians. But like Charlie Brown with a football, the R&R &R folks never seem to learn that their mission is futile. The latest R&R &R target is the 12th century Pope Celestine III, courtesy of Robert Sisko, co-author of the anti sede Vicantus screed, True or False Pope. Writing in The Remnant, Mr. Sisko claims that one, in one of his decrees in a matrimonial case, Celestine III taught a doctrinal error concerning the indissolubility of sacramental marriage. And two, Pope Gregory IX incorporated the error into the Church's universal disciplinary laws. The details of the alleged error need not concern us here. It related to what is called the Pauline privilege. Our interest, rather, is in Mr. Sisko's attempt to transform Celestine's decree into a universal disciplinary law. He thinks he's launched a ballistic missile that will obliterate St. Evacontism. But a quick check of commentaries by canon law experts such as Nas, Capello, and Cecconiani shows that Mr. Sisko's shoddy scholarship has caused his arguments to, shall we say, misfire? For one thing, Mr. Sisko plays either dishonest or stupid with the text from St. Robert Bellarmine. Mr. Sisko portrays the writings of another theologian, Alfonso de Castro, as Bellarmine's own commentary on the case of Pope Celestine. But in fact, Bellarmine was merely summing up de Castro's position as an objection in order to refute it. This is obvious because Bellarmine immediately follows the passage Mr. Sisko quotes with the word respondeo, I respond, and starts another paragraph. So, Mr. Sisko has committed a flub here, akin to that of an ignorant first-year seminarian, who mistakes an objection in the Summa Theologica for the actual position of St. Thomas Aquinas. But in any case, Bellarmine blows off de Castro's charge against Celestine, and with it, that of Mr. Sisko, by saying that at the time, the whole issue had still been a matter of opinion. Got that? A matter of opinion. So with nothing defined, theologians were still free to offer various opinions, which is just what Celestine implied by using the phrase non videtur nobis. It does not seem to us. Mr. Sisko also claims that Celestine's error was incorporated into canon law through the promulgation of the Decretals of Gregory IX in 1234, which thus gave it, he claims, full juridical value as a law text. With these grand declarations, Mr. Sisko has really rolled into the quicksand. For starters, the compiler of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, Pietro Cardinal Gaspari, a rather authoritative source to say the least, said there was neither a trace nor a vestige of Celestine's decree in the Decretals of Gregory IX. Well, where did it come from then? 
It is found in what is called the Second Compilation, a private collection of decrees assembled by John of Wales in 1210. This collection, says the canonist Cicognani, did not obtain public authority. It was nevertheless one of the many collections of church decrees that St. Raymond of Penafor drew upon to assemble the official collection that would be promulgated as the Decretals of Gregory IX. But the text of Celestine, despite what Mr. Sisko says, never made it. Cardinal Bio states flatly that it never became law. And he adds, Gregory IX even expressly commanded that it be excluded from the authentic collection of canons made by St. Raymond. Celestine's decree, therefore, ended up among what the canonists call the partes de cise. That is to say, those parts of the decretals that the compiler and the legislator left out or cut off. And the partes de cise, says Cicugnani, have no legal force or even historic value, for in many cases they were inaccurately introduced. So, how did Mr. Sisko make such an idiotic error? He spied what he thought was a gotcha text in the 1959 Richter Freiburg edition of the Decretals. Voila, he thinks, the end of sedevacantism as we know it, lock and load. The text of Celestine's decree, however, unlike the text before and after it, is printed in italics rather than regular characters. Had Mr. Sisko read the editor's introduction, he would have learned that italics signified that a portion of a text was one of the partes de cise omitted from the text that Gregory finally promulgated. It was cut out, and along with it, another one of Mr. Sisko's arguments. To sum up on the case of Pope Celestine, Mr. Sisko committed a major blunder by presenting St. Robert Bellarmine's summary of an objection as Bellarmine's actual position, which was that Celestine was merely expressing what was considered a defensible theological opinion at the time. Mr. Sisko's claim that Celestine's error was incorporated into canon law is false. It had no legal force and Gregory IX expressly commanded that the passage, quote, be excluded from the authentic collection of canons. Mr. Sisko could have found this out in 15 minutes, just as I did, by looking in a few canonical commentaries, or even just bothering to find out why the editor of his precious gotcha text printed it in italics. There are other errors in Mr. Sisko's article, egregious, dishonest, and redolent of Protestantism. But these we will leave for a future video. All of them fit into the bigger picture of recognize and resists decades-long campaign to destroy authentic Catholic teaching on the doctrinal and disciplinary authority of a true pope. Their pope, like this guy here, is still a cardboard pope. But for the moment, in the matter of the so-called error of Pope Celestine, we can enjoy the sight of yet another specious anti sedevacantist argument going down in flames. Sorry.